members of Afrohun Leadership Summit. The summit is composed of all the deans of the schools of veterinary and, vet and public health in the network. Faculty, students, Afrohun staff, and my dear colleague, Professor Kabasa, who's been walking this road with me for very many years. Ladies and gentlemen, today is a special day uh, in the life of some of us, and maybe it would have taken place when we are no longer here, but fortunately we are here. Professor Kabasa talked about the young people that started the work, and I, I expect that the, the IT will show some, some photographs of those young people. Professor Kabasa started by saying 2009, there was discussion. I want to make a correction. In, nine, in, 20, in 2005, there was born a project which was on leadership for public health. And the PI was Professor Javed Kaleo, who is in Dar es Salaam, Muhimbiri, and myself. And this project was started off by our USID father, whom I would call the father of Afrohun now, because Afrohun, I think, is a grandchild of what we started. And he was called Dr. Dennis Caro. And he had a vision for Africa. He had a vision for public health and veterinary. But we started as public health two universities, Muhimbiri University School of Public Health, Muhas, and Makai University School of Public Health. And before we finished that project, Dr. Dennis Caro expressed that there was a need not to leave out the veterinary, veterinarians, but to bring them on board so that we would have discussions about human beings and animals. And the year was 2009, but we had our very first meeting in the Serena, Lake Vic, with deans of schools of public health and deans of the school of schools of public health. Now, when these deans were invited, they did not know why they had been invited because they were invited under the, the auspices of Life Air Leadership Initiative for Public Health in East Africa. And when they came, after the presentation of Dr. Dennis Carroll with his assistant, Rob Henry, whom I cherish, both of them I cherish for starting this, Members who were there decided that we become one. They did not wait for the second day for the discussions to start thinking about one health. The presentation was so clear that there was a need for us to have one focus. And therefore, we had our O'Shea first meeting endorsed that day, and we started looking for the name. We were universities from East Africa. We had DRC, and we had Ethiopia. It was very difficult <coughs> excuse me, to have a name that cuts across all these countries. So we went to sleep over it for a name. In the morning, those who had gone to nursery schools, and like me, came up with several names. But we said, if we say at the end, we say network, that time networks were forming and breaking. Whenever funding would stop, networks would collapse. Networks of schools of public health, networks of 
veterinary had collapsed in many countries. So people said, we shall not add a word network on our name so that we can be recognized. We also agreed that this, this association we are going to make, we are all going to make an attempt to convince our universities to accept it as a university wide so that the, it would be embraced by not only public health and debate, but by the vice chancellors and so on. And I will tell you that at one point we had a meeting for vice chancellors for this O'Shea. So the name O'Shea was born One Health Central and Eastern Africa. Central and Eastern, not East Africa, was born and there was a celebration and we took the name. We gave ourselves time to talk to our university leadership so that we would come back together and now start thinking how we need to run. USID had its resources to support us. We had to have a secretariat. We, have to had, we had to have people who would run this network. Fortunately, all the deans that came returned emails to say their vice chancellors had approved. Each country had two schools, one school of public health, one school of veterinary, except Kenya, where they were conflicting and they had two schools of, of public health, Moi and, and Nairobi. And in some cases, the schools were in the same university. In some cases, the schools were in the different universities. So we met quickly and we formed the board. Now, to form the board was not also easy because we didn't know each other. We didn't know whom to vote. So we said, each country appoints one person to become a board member. Those schools sat in their countries appointed or selected one person to represent them on the board. So to cut the long story short, we started strongly. People believed in what we were doing that for the first time in the history of Africa, we are bringing something that will bring together these two professionals that we are looking at the same things, but in different silos. The silos were broken. I remember those days, Professor Kabas used the word silo more than a hundred times in a day because he was fighting to make sure the silos are broken and they were broken then and they will never be, be there again. Now, we continued with support from USID and I will mention later the people who have worked with us. And maybe let me mention them here. When we started, but we had to have a partner in the US where the resources were first. Remember, when we started, the resources didn't come straight to us because of managing the resources to the different universities. Although now we are so strong that we can manage resources from the as the secretary to tell you. But in our countries, after talking to these universities, what happened? There was a revolution. In the other sector, in the public sector, had to leave. Now, so we coordinating committees. Alors, nous avons décidé d'avoir une entente, une ambiance commune, afin de pouvoir travailler ensemble en tant que une intervention dans le domaine de la santé. 
with the creation of this reason, we mobilize the students. Si ça tenait au chaya au début. That's why we have mobilized the students. Students clubs that are now in university now. We have the club de France qui était très fort qui ont participé dans des activités de Shea et c'était le club le plus important, le plus fort dans toutes les universités. Ces clubs continuent à être le plus fort dans les universités. Nous avons développé un programme académique que nous avons partagé dans toutes les universités participantes, les dix pays. In the US, nous avons obtenu notre partenaire aux États-Unis. We had BAI, qui était reconnu. Il y avait BAI, who were administering the resources. But I must say, they are. Mais je dois dire que ce n'était pas d'une base universitaire. Donc, ils avaient des problèmes à travailler dans le domaine universitaire. Nous avons aidé à comprendre pour qu'ils puissent générer des ressources pour les activités universitaires. On travaillait surtout en ligne avec eux. Nous avions obtenu un certain moment donné, mais on avait pas Jeff Bender, Jeff Atkins, and others. But we had one more. And we had one more. Who was that? Bob Henry. I know that he moved on to other things besides his brother. But he was a strong peer. And later on, up to now, we have our new one, Melanie Crane, who is a fantastic lady, who understands the whole of Africa. We had our people. We have another thoughts. I hope you have a son. J'espère que son vous êtes en ligne. Nous avons eu une champion de recherche. Les gens qui nous ont aidé à gérer la ressource dans le réseau. Faculté, étudiants, research et research. Nous avons eu le professeur Devo Kuchiba qui va parler en anglais. And she will also tell us our newest born of a for whom called stop. Some of the line of those of you who are here, not know stop, but talk about it. Now, don't. On the view, we must expand. On the view, we need to share the project. Because we are seeing the process in Eastern and Central Africa. So the board agreed to expand, and I'm sure Professor Wambara will speak to this. And we included other countries. In those countries, when they came on board, they couldn't fit in the definition in the definition of Moshea. So we said we'll change. And there was another debate. What did we call ourselves? In 2019, we decided to call ourselves Afrohun. Africa One Health Network. Now, I told you in the beginning, we said we cannot use the word network. Correct? Why did we accept that we put network now? Because we are stable, we are not breaking, we cannot break. Our network is too strong for anybody to think that the network will break. The network now has a new project with the new partner called Health Workforce Next Gen. Led by UC Davis and one Franklin, and we will come the workforce. The new name. The new branding. We are now new, as Professor Kabasa. We are now younger. Some of us are still put down our, our tools, but the people that we have recruited are so important. We are still trying to improve the quality. We are still trying to improve the quality. We are still trying to improve the quality. In a special way, before I say, I want to recognize and thank the forum people.
Professor Japheth Cleo, who I started with, 2005, we are still together. Now we have come so old, we have old, we have grey hair, we must live, we must live the stage, but the Cleo, we shall talk. And I want to thank our board chair, Professor Firmino Wambura. He is a strong man. He has led this network to strength. And in a special way, also, I want to thank the leadership of Macaulay University, Professor Barnabas Nongwe, the University of Macaulay, this network, on behalf of the whole university, with those who are the facilities that are given a lot of one hour, now we start a fresh, I say a little more, with those who are like to welcome all of you to our Afrohone, notre nouvelle accélération, nous partirons continuer. Je me dis vous confirmer que nous allons continuer dans la lutte de pouvoir avancer en ce que nous sommes en train de faire. Merci. Thank you so much, uh, Professor William Vazeo, for that incisive remark. During the bumper road of nurturing the alliance, the membership was increasing, the interest was growing, the diversity of views and the submissions on what was happening was growing. Are things okay? They are not okay. Is this well? Is not well? So much was the discussion as we would expect across the diversity of partners that had now expanded and kept growing. The chairman of the board, Professor Philemon Wambura, as our leader of the board, and William focused on improvement and progress rather than perfectionism. I think it's perfect. They were not perfect, but the focus was let us make progress, and we have kept making progress. I want to thank you, uh, William and uh, Professor Wambura, and I would like now to invite uh, Professor Wambura, who has been leading, to make uh, some remarks to this assembly. Thank you. The system. Are we logged in? We want to be sure Professor Ambura is Uh, while Professor Wambura is uh, logging in, we would like to invite Dennis Is he logged in? I cannot hear. Okay. We would like to go to the next person. Each of these uh, leaders brought diversity in the journey. 
Dr. Dennis Carroll brought uh, the overall vision and breathed into us the direction and the champion started to move. But permanently on the leadership team was Marilyn Crane from the USID, the people of America, who was able to see what was happening and kept encouraging, moderating, and guiding until we have what we have today. I would like, therefore, at this particular juncture, to invite Marilyn uh, to make her remarks. I kindly log her in. Thank you. I hope your technology is uh, so far is breathing. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the host needed to unmute me, so apologies for um, for that. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kabasa, for that warm uh, welcome. I appreciate the kind invitation to um, to have me make some remarks, um, and uh, I just wanted to. Okay, I can be talking. Oh no, it sounds like there might be somebody else with an open mic right now. So um, thank you for inviting me um, to make these remarks. It's been a very exciting and dynamic year. I thought um, it might be helpful just to start just with a, with a walkthrough, a little bit about uh, what a One Health Workforce is about. Um, so a One Health workforce is about fostering multi-sectoral approaches to uh, challenging health problems. It's about building collaborative competence, technical competence, and establishing uh, an enabling environment. Um, you kind of need these three elements in order to have a, a One Health workforce. In um, looking at the One Health workforce, we are looking at taking One Health core competencies. Those are the technical and the um, soft skills and using them to improve capacity to detect, prevent and respond to uh, different emerging health threats. In terms of uh, building a pathway to a One Health workforce, there's, there are the three elements that I mentioned, the identifying workforce needs, strengthening the workforce, and supporting enabling environment. These kind of, these are all interrelated, even though I have them kind of represented as a, as a one going in one direction. But um, these, are, these are what we feel are are the correct. Is it possible to mute the person speaking right now? Exoneration. You're talking about that two percent. Okay, so with identifying workforce needs, um, we're looking at um, you know mapping. Um, human resource systems, workforce assessments, country health workforce strategic planning. Um, in terms of strengthening it, we're looking at um, uh, training the current and future One Health workers, um, improving teaching, applied research, and outreach, 
um, to enhance one health capacities and just strengthening overall academic uh, programs um, to respond to the, the workforce needs. And then in terms of uh, the supporting environment, it's building not only the capacity of the networks, but improving advocacy and, and bringing um, research and knowledge from the networks into policy making as well as establishing knowledge management systems. So as you can see, these the the, the identifying these workforce needs, they these are these provide the evidence base towards establishing and strengthening the workforce. They also contribute towards supporting the enabling environment, particularly in terms of the advocacy and knowledge management. Now, John is gonna go into a little more detail about the goal and objectives of the One Health Workforce Next Gen project, but um, I did just wanna present them here. Um, as you can see, the goal is to empower Siahoon, Afrahoon and their member institutions to develop and deliver sustainable training programs. Um, so it's about empowering the workforce, conducting workforce assessments, but there's also the third objective, which is about organization sustainability and resilience and really building the capacity, particularly of the regional networks to ensure they're capable of, of acquiring and managing um, different funding streams. The One Health Workforce Next Gen project is a follow on of the One Health Workforce project. Um, but it's not a necessarily a continuation. There's several innovations that are really important in understanding it. Um, one of the main ones is uh, the new types of uh, partnerships. Under Next Generation, we're looking at um, collaborating with non-traditional schools and faculties, such as uh, vocational institutions, um, engaging the private sector, and um, bringing participants from non-network countries into it. We're also looking at embedding, embedding an adaptive management function um, that will include knowledge management and learning plans and tracking workforce. Um, we're looking at new educational offerings, continuing education and programs and, and alumni support, um, creating a One Health um, Workforce Academy where, uh, uh, where uh, current and future One Health workers can gain certification and even updating the One Health core competency framework. As I mentioned as well, there are this idea of empowering the, the regional networks. And as part of this, we're, we're looking at transition awards on around year three, which is just around the corner. And that'll include a, a phased funding approach. Um, and um, throughout all of our activities, uh, the project will be looking at helping the networks identify other sources of funding so that they will have um, more resiliency and not uh, be so much uh, dependent on one donor. So there's been a lot of success um, to date. And so these numbers are a combination of the original One Health Workforce numbers uh, and um, the first uh, six months of One Health Workforce next gen. So that would be through March 31st. Um, and they represent a combination of both Afrahoon and Siohoon programming. Um, so to date, we have six One Health related graduate programs that have been de developed with um, many more underway. 60 One Health student clubs have been established at member universities. Um, 3,800 faculty have received training or professional development. Um, 12,800 students have been trained and 5,600 uh, current um, professionals have been trained. So these numbers I, I anticipate once we have um, the second half of, of the first year's data will increase significantly. Um, and so we're very proud and impressed with the achievements um, of the old project, but also with um, what is underway with the One Health Workforce Next Gen. Again, it's, it's, it's a different project, but it will build on um, and is building on the, uh, the original One Health Workforce. This past year has been very challenging. Um, the first year included a launch, which included transitioning from the old project to the new one, um, establishing sub awards and, and handling a lot of the administrative matters um, 
uh, overtook at least uh, the first part. And, and as uh, the project was really just starting to launch, COVID hit. And I can say, you know, looking at how the network and its country, um, its country offices have handled it has been inspiring. I, I can also say that um, it would not have been possible without a, a strong commitment from the Afrohoon executive board, uh, uh, the secretariat staff, the, uh, the country administrators and um, country managers, uh, nor the, the One Health Workforce Next Gen um, Consortium. A lot of people uh, spent a lot of uh, late nights um, planning and pulling together work plans and, um, and re-envisioning what was already an exciting work plan to be more responsive to COVID. And I think it, at times it probably was frustrating, but now we are really bearing witness um, to what has been accomplished. And so as we see um, over the next two days, uh, the, the, the achievements that have been uh, already accomplished in just the first year of the project, I, I think it's, it's, it's amazing to see how much was in fact accomplished against um, what could have been um, almost insurmountable odds. I, I, again, I'm impressed with the commitment, the innovation, and the just the the strong technical background, everybody, and and I'm very much appreciative of what everybody has done, and look forward to seeing and learning more about what has been accomplished um, during the first year that isn't hasn't been included in the report. So thank you again for giving me this opportunity to kind of talk about broadly what a One Health Workforce is, but also just to um, just to express my excitement about the first year and the transition to the second year, and also the, the transition from Oshea to Afrohoon. Um, all things to be commended and I'm very excited about. Thank you all. And that is it for me. Thank you. You were clapping, kindly clap. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for taking us through and walking us through this journey and believing in us and supporting every step that we have taken to mold this network. As we go along, I'll keep recognizing the members that are logging in. We are adopting to new ways of doing things. I would like to recognize the new members of Afrohun from Cote d'Ivoire. They have joined, they are online. You are most welcome. All others who joined in when we had started, you are all most welcome to this launch. We are excited that Professor Wambura has finally logged in. I had made a remark about Professor Wambura that during the journey, he focused on progress, improvement, rather than perfecting things. All along the way, we have had challenges, and people raised the issues. Whatever they would raise, would say we'll improve but we must make progress. We want to thank Professor Wambura for his leadership, and we are happy you have now logged in. I would like to invite you, our chair, to make remarks at this very important day of launching Afrohun as we transition from Oshia. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much, uh, David, for is welcome. I would like to thank you very much uh, sorry for the challenge we had, but uh, let me start uh, by thanking the organizers of this meeting so that we can, uh, although with the challenge of the COVID-19, but we are able to meet and make progress. The Vice Chancellor, Macquarie University, our chief guest today, the distinguished government officials, USID representatives, development partners, 
vice chancellors and other university management members, members of the Afron Leadership Summit, Afron CEO and Deputy CEO, Afron staff, faculty, students, ladies and gentlemen. You are most welcome to this event as we launch African One Health University Network. It has been a very long journey for us when the One Health concept was introduced to our universities, actively by OSHEA. This was seen as going against the norms in some of the institutions. To see that we have reached this point in the life of the network is a true milestone. I do thank you everyone who has a part of this work and this journey. As your share and now Afrohun, we are very happy that we contributed to understanding and appreciation of One Health concept and approach across Africa. So you have known as One Health Central Africa or share for the last 10 years. But for the last two years or so, the network leadership has been discussing the network growth and the new direction. Strategically, it was important for us to start looking beyond the university rooms and engage other actors, private, civil society, business, vocational education and training, as well as government. It was equally important to respond to request to join the network. Sorry for. Sorry for the. Yeah, sorry. Let me continue. At this point, allow to officially welcome uh, our colleague from Côte d'Ivoire, Felix Foucault Foyer University School of Medicine, who are the latest members in the network. This repositioning is both internal and external. Internally, we are all aligning our operations to the external growth aspirations. We currently have country managers at country level, as opposed to focal persons we used to operate uh, originally. We are moving from institutional focus to building national one health workforce development programs. This also calls for the alignment of our attitudes and the behaviors as network leadership and management. Externally, we are repackaging what we offer to match the growing needs of the network stakeholders. The COVID-19 pandemic has provided food for thought to universities. Revisiting our teaching methods, how do we blend virtual tools with our highly impactful feedback experiential learning approaches the role of universities in response to management of pandemics. The need to scale up the training of pandemic period workforce. So as a network and as partners working in this area, these are the key issues to think about as we venture into another decade of our life. The afro board is committed to continue providing strategic leadership to the network. Members, as I conclude, I thank all board members, leadership summit members, the CEO and the Peter CEO with all our staff at the secretariat 
and the country offices for all your hard work you have been doing. Let me tell you that we don't take this contribution for granted. As Afro management, we appreciate what you have been doing. And I argue to continue doing it because this is very important to the network and our welfare and our advancement of Afro Hoon. To our US partners, I would like to thank you very much that we have worked with us since the network was established. University of Minnesota, Tufts University, PII, and others. Allow me to thank you, the One Year Workforce Next Generation Consortium, led by US Davis, who are the US partners for this phase of USID funding. For the work so far, you have done very excellent work. We also like to thank you, the, the IDRC Canada, for the work they have supported us. So with these remarks members, I'm very happy to join this meeting today. And I'm very honored to be with you today. I do welcome you all members to this two day event. Thank you very much and may God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wambura, the chair of Afro Horn Board. Uh, give another clap. Thank you. As the board was maturing, one salient observation was that there should be uh, more crossbreeding. We should be more gender uh, balanced so that we have a better input and transformation going on in the region. Professor Debi Kocheva was brought in unanimously agreed upon to join the board. Deborah was representing and is still representing a wide spectrum of partners that contributed immensely during the 10 years, the decade of growth and nurturing. In many of her statements that she made, I picked one that she should know. That the higher we are placed, the more humble we should become and walk. She was so endowed with much capacity in research, in all fields of leadership, but she was talking in, with humility and diffusing her capacities in very simple and gentle ways. She is a heavy mobilizer of resources. And as we speak now, she has mobilized hey, yeah. a mm -hmm. that will be uh, spearheading further growth. We want to thank you, Deborah, for leading us in that way and showing us the example. I would like to invite you, Professor Kocheva, to make your remarks. Thank you. the technology is your unmute. There we have. Thank you so much, Professor Kabasa, for your, for your very kind introduction. Um, and thank you to all for the opportunity to, to join you today and to congratulate uh, Afrohoon on the amazing achievements of the past over 10 years. 
And so we've heard from Professor Bozeo about the beginnings of Osea and then Afrahum. And I've been privileged to be a traveler with you on this journey for the past 10 years, uh, mostly representing um, as, a, as a dean of a veterinary school and the faculty, the importance of the universities in what you've done as a network. And so um, the deans, the faculty, the other partners, the, the secretariat staff who are wonderfully talented, all of those parts were necessary to, to bring you to this point. And so congratulations. Uh, this, is a, this is a great opportunity to celebrate your achievements. So I, I wanted to just make a couple of remarks about um, perspectives that I have on Afrahoon, um, as well as the partnership between Osea Afrahoon and Siahoon. Um, with the lens of 10 years looking back, um, I see a thriving set of partnerships uh, that did not exist 10 years ago. Um, along the way, there's been enormous return on investment in the networks by USAID. And I will uh, reiterate what Professor Bezeo said that uh, Dennis Carroll was really one of the first to stand up at least in the US and say One Health matters. And so the fact that um, One Health became the principal driver for formation of these networks is essential as we look around the world today and we see the importance of zoonotic disease, the relevance of identifying and stopping spillover and the fact that we have to work together to achieve those things. So really all of the partners who've been committed over the years and, and those partners, some of them have been mentioned, uh, University of Minnesota, Tufts, University of California at Davis, uh, many others and new ones, which I'll mention in a moment, all have been advantaged by the partnerships with the member universities. And so it's, a, it's an investment that paid off not only um, in individual projects, but in the kind of capacity building and faculty development, um, which will yield fruit for years and decades to come. Um, it's even though we tend to focus in our work plans on the technical training and the, the tasks of the day or the month, it's really the long-term achievements, the permanent achievements that a network like Afrahoon uh, makes that will make uh, a lasting and sustainable difference. I think until in some ways these networks were created and Afrahoon grew and, and became stronger and stronger, um, we didn't fully appreciate the power of university cultures in driving, um, in driving these enterprises. And, and that includes research. And, and, and I look now at the, at the fruit that's being born of the investment in research capacity building in the universities. Where are we now? We are in a position to have to learn about spillover and to intervene in it and to assess the interventions. We're in a position as, as, uh, as scientists to want to know where emerging viruses and pathogens are. The work of PREDICT was essential in that. So the university culture of, of research and learning um, across all of your member universities and your US partners has just been um, a unique uh, dynamic and one that I think has been very successful and will continue to be. Um, the outlook is, is amazing when you think about the fact that now the, the faculty who have come through many of the programs that have been established over the past 10 years um, are now becoming the leaders in those programs. The students who have populated your One Health um, clubs in these institutions, whether they become leaders uh, per se in One Health, they have internalized those One Health principles and it's a way of thinking, which is uh, very important and allows us to sustain that diversity and inclusivity of thought that makes a difference really in all walks of life, but certainly in the endeavors that go on through a network like Afrahoon. Uh, the phase that you've moved into now with One Health Workforce Next Gen is, is exciting. It is, uh, it is continuing to do all the good work that, have, that has been done before on curriculum, on work in the field, on student training, but it extends that to administrative capacity building and financial uh, management capacity building. That work has been going on since uh, 
Respond and One Health Workforce and now One Health Workforce Next Gen. And so I'm very pleased to say that um, as, as the project director for a new program, Stop Spillover, which again is a USAID funded effort um, to, to assess risk, to identify spillover points, to intervene and to stem uh, amplification and spread of viruses. All of that capacity that's been developed over these past 10 years through these other programs and other partners will be brought to bear uh, to, to be able to do this work. A, an essential partner in that work is Afrohoon. Afrohoon is the, is the organizing force of that in, in Africa and the same for Siahoon in Southeast Asia and Asia. And so again, return on investment uh, we wouldn't be able to do the work of stop spillover in the way that we've proposed to do it were it not for the success of Afrohoon and the One Health University networks. And so that is a that is truly a point of celebration. It is truly something that the world needs in terms of being able to tap the university talents and culture to solve these very difficult problems. Uh, we don't do it alone. It's essential that uh, we understand that all of this is predicated on stakeholders, how they view their country, how they view the needs, the best paths to intervention. Absolutely essential partner governments. The networks have been a uh, hugely important uh, bridge to, to bring the science and the governments and the work on the ground with stakeholders together. And so, um, so it's a very, it's a complex system. And, um, and I, I would end by uh, being, being presumptuous and saying, I, I speak in some ways for the many, many partners that have been uh, to this point, again, including Tufts, um, Minnesota, uh, University of California Davis, which uh, Professor Mazette will do certainly the honors on that. But I'd also like to perhaps preview the partnerships to come. And so in, in the single project of Stop Spillover, we have 16 partners. And so we will be adding to all of the present universities, um, University of Washington, the Broad Institute that sits between Harvard and MIT, University of Glasgow, UCLA, University of Nebraska Medical Center, as well as certainly not to forget the, the very important private sector partners, our NGOs, IGOs, um, government. So it, it's an astonishing number of talented people who come together to solve problems. And Afrohoon and the networks have been a focal point for making that happen. And so I congratulate all the leadership and, uh, and all of the faculty and deans and staff who have supported that effort. So thank you again for uh, allowing me to join you and congratulations. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Kochiva, for those uh, kind remarks on uh, a very historical day. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to recognize uh, more guests and friends who have joined in, both online and uh, here face to face, I would like to recognize the presence of the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs uh, at Makere University. Uh, Professor Umar Kakumba is here. You are most welcome. Thank you. I would also like to recognize and congratulate that uh, Dr. Dan Scaro is now online. He has joined us eventually, and uh, the, the father and founder of the Oshia and Afrohu now, I would like to recognize the presence of the Deputy Director uh, Health Services, not Deputy, Director General Health Services in Uganda, who is also online, Dr. Henry Mwevesa. Thank you so much for uh, making it and uh, finally logging in through this technology. As 
the alliance was growing, there's a tendency for people to get used and settle in. So you get used to your troubles and you have few things and you begin to settle into, uh, assume certain things are okay. But the nurturing efforts of the USID uh, during these 10 years continue to create dynamic efforts to ensure that a new blood and a new efforts can be rejuvenated. So towards at the end of the 10 years, we were not sure whether we would have more funding and support from the USID. And everybody was asking questions, what next? So eventually, one lesson came in as we were engaging with uh, Dr. Dennis Carroll and Marilyn and all other partners. And they kept telling us that, well, don't hope in USID only. Make sure that new opportunities come up and you can embrace them. Prepare to move on and to be sustainable. So what happened then through the dynamic leadership of our, our leaders, it turned out, and I kept hearing Marilyn saying this, we should have our imaginations beyond what we have. The partners should not just settle in. Let your imaginations release your possibilities that we have so that we're able to exploit. And they kept encouraging us on that. So eventually the USID put up a competitive framework on how to support the growth of the network. This is when uh, the new leadership of the network from the Af American partners came in. Professor Jonah Mozart is now the director of the One Health Workforce Next Generation Initiative. And she represents a huge consortium of partners that are injecting new blood into the Afro Hoon to make sure this agency will be sustainable and will support the growth of the continent and the global health security agenda. I would like for at this stage to invite Professor Jonah to make her remarks as she injects new blood into the network. You are most welcome, Jonah. Thank you, my thank you, my friend. I'm so happy to be with you, and uh, really, it's nice to be. Uh, considered new blood. Sometimes as we age, we, we uh, really appreciate being considered new blood. That's really, really nice. Um, I, I would say that uh, the world has, has certainly moved on and, and given us pause. Uh, I appreciate that all of you out there are going through many different things and um, for our network partners, um, many are, are having to join from afar. We wish we were all together. And um, when I hear my colleagues like Professor Bazeo giving his opening remarks uh, and reminding us about what we were going through in 2009, I don't know if you all um, have the same perception, but my, my first experience of uh, the emerging pandemic threats, now emerging threats team at USAID was really uh, in person was right at the beginning of the H1N1 uh, terrible pandemic that we thought would be much worse than it was. And then uh, if we fast forward 11 years later, we're now here in this uh, terrible tragedy of um, COVID-19. I know that uh, we're all struggling, but um, we're re also responding and resilient. 
we we've been talking about maybe the, the Afrahun launch, but the organization has been growing and is, uh, you know, we, we talked about it being a baby to a small child. I think today might be telling us that uh, more like a troublesome teenager because we're going through some real uh, Zoom glitches, of course, today uh, with people um, struggling to get logged on and interpretation but i but i think that if we even think about 30 years ago when we were so much less prepared for this kind of terrible tragedy how would we be coping uh, if we didn't all have internet if we didn't all have our our cell phones and so there is hope there is hope that if we work together we can do what is really necessary to get out of this terrible tragedy and i think that um, Afrahun and this launch is proving that to us with the goal in mind of having the next generation of world health leaders trained to really respect each other, think about multidisciplinary respect, using the One Health approach to consider the interconnectedness of the health of people, animals, the environment, and plants. I think that we will have a much, much stronger and better future. So I'm honored today to move from a kind of uh, sister partner as I've been with this division and with this team uh, as a, uh, a more distant relative, but now uh, I'm joining uh, the nuclear family uh, mm -hmm. and appreciating the generation that has come before us with O'Shea and those partners, DAI, University of Minnesota and Tufts. And you heard from my uh, wonderful colleague, um, Professor Kochivar just now. I re I'm able to come to you as uh, someone to represent additional global partners, uh, including UC Davis, my organization, but also EcoHealth Alliance, Ada Health Strategies, ICAP at Columbia University, uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, University of California, Irvine, and the ECHO team at University of New Mexico. So we come invigorated, the new blood, uh, but uh, with the, the DNA of this team and what has gone on for a decade before. And I do believe that what we can do together and synergistically bringing historical partners and new partners together um, for uh, the next generation of O'Shea, which is Afrahun, uh, can be amazing. It can be the role model for all One Health programs around the world. And it can be and provide the uh, backbone and the technology and the um, training materials to set the standard for One Health. Uh, as, as we all know, in this uh, terrible COVID situation, we need a change. We need the world to be prepared and that's what One Health can do for us. So as Marilyn showed you in her slides, and I'll show you some slides about this tomorrow as well, um, the One Health Workforce Next Generation Project is now just one project of this amazing Afrahun team. And our goal is to work together and learn from our Afrahun colleagues, as well as our colleagues in Southeast Asia and the Siahun network to empower One Health Universities to sustainably develop and deliver world leading model programs and equip those professionals with the transdisciplinary skills that can get us out of this COVID pandemic, but also keep us from getting into one, another pandemic ever again. We can't stop every spillover event, but we can mitigate it and shut down 
these problems early and at their sources wherever they may be in the world so that they don't get out of control. And even if they do spread out of the places where they originate, our, each of our countries can be much better prepared. And I think we saw in our innovations in the face of COVID-19, we saw our team with Afrahoon coming together to really respond. The ECHO platform was used to really bring the community of practice across uh, Africa and the participating organizations and universities to be more ready than most places in the world were when the um, terrible virus was coming to your boundaries, your shores, your borders. So I think that you, um, you already have shown the power of the network and I look forward to the future. And as we described, we do have several different pieces within the One Health Workforce Next Generation, including workforce training and empowerment, of course, but also workforce assessment and tracking so that we know what our graduates are doing, how they're doing in the world, how they're contributing, and what needs to be done so that the ones that follow them have even better skills. So we'll be tracking and providing a platform um, for the universities to track. And then, as mentioned, the organizational sustainability. We really are committed to um, the movement to decolonize global health. And so we are a partner and we are learning as much as we are um, bringing our skills. So it is with that One Health approach where we all bring the skills of our teams together that we will move forward and partner for the global community and for improved world health. So I'm excited uh, to, to turn this over back over to the team and um, share with you all that's coming in the next few days. I think all of you have probably seen in the chat and um, popping up that we have some technology innovations today. Hopefully we'll also be able to cope with this new hybrid of trying some of us uh, being uh, sheltering, others being really nicely social distanced and using all of the public health security measures. But that hybrid is bringing some challenges I know that we're having with the, um, with the translation and I apologize for that and hopefully we'll be able to sort that. I think we're, we're ready for it on Zoom completely or in the room completely, but the hybrid is, is throwing us some curves. Similarly, I wanna thank all of you who um, possibly uh, registered early and were ready for some conversation yesterday that didn't happen. Uh, I'm sorry again for the schedule changes that uh, these, um, these very difficult times bring to us, uh, but I appreciate you joining us again today. And then finally, the innovation piece that we can share is the graphic recording. I think you're probably enjoying that. It's popped up on the screen. It's pinned so that you can watch it. We're doing live graphic recording. Our uh, wonderful artist, Tracy, has asked that we not capture her screen while she's going. We will have the opportunity to capture her screen when we put it up and pin it at the breaks. But we thought seeing the evolution of um, how the days are going Going and, and really reflecting the evolution of Afrahoon would be a beautiful concept to use for this launch as we evolve now further together. So uh, I look forward to the next few days and the decades to come from Afrahoon and in their leadership role. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Jonah, the director of the One Health Workforce Next Gen Initiative that is injecting new blood into the Afrohun to take off into the next phase. We are very grateful for those uh, remarks. As I mentioned to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor, our guest of honor and uh, 
the Deputy Vice Chancellor and all who are here, distinguished guests online. Um, we are going to the next two speeches. One will be from uh, the representative of the government of Uganda, the Director General for Health Services uh, in Uganda. Uh, before I'll make some remarks well before I invite him to do so. And thereafter, we shall have the remarks from Dr. Dennis Caro, who we regard as the father of uh, the One Health Revolution. Uh, he's packed off the innovation here in Africa and uh, across to Asia, and uh, the fire is going on. Um, when Dr. Henry Mwebe has finished making the remarks, I'll uh, request William to come and introduce uh, Dennis. They have related quite for some time, so he can uh, be able to articulate certain things about him uh, much more than I may uh, comment. But one thing I would like to say is that when things I remember, uh, one thing I remember about Dennis, that when things were about to collapse, I think uh, William and other members online, you may remember, it was somewhere, I think, in some forest, uh, in this very uh, hotel, I think the next day we went to another hotel to change venues. Building networks of uh, these diverse cultures and <laughs> diverse experiences across uh, the continent is not an easy thing. So at some stage we said, I think enough is enough. William Deckley has said, I'm not going to continue unless this and this and this happens. I think Dawoodi, first of all, you keep steering. Let me uh, have peace. Dr. Dennis Carroll flew in from the US. And a series of conversations went on. I will not preempt William's remarks. But I thought I should comment on that. While we get up and move to do all that, you just get up and move. We never know what people who maintain the ecosystem do. And that's what the government does. They give us the enabling environment. So you just get up and come to negotiate. You go and discuss, you fly. You, you take on all these conversations. We are extremely grateful to the government of Uganda that has been hosting us and is hosting the entire universal network here. We are extremely grateful to the various governments in the member countries that are involved in the networks that have been enabling what has been going on. Dr. Henry Mwebe is involved in many, Mwebesa has been involved in many frameworks across East Af and Eastern Africa and all across Africa and beyond. So he will make some remarks on behalf of his colleagues, both here and uh, in other member states. Dr. Henry, you are most welcome. We are very grateful for all the support you have given us to bring us this far. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you. You can uh, activate the button, ICT team. Thank you. Hello? 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 Are you hearing yes. me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, our chief guest, Vice Chancellor of Kerala University, Professor Banabas Nawangwe. 
representatives from USID, government representatives, One Health Platform members, development partners, university management staff, the chief executive officer and the deputy and your staff of Afrohun, faculty members, students of the university, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and greetings from the Minister of Health. As you've heard, I'm Wevesa Henry, the Director General Health Services in the Ministry of Health. Ladies and gentlemen, allow, allow me to thank you all for making time to this very important event where we are launching the One Health on the African continent. We are converged here today to witness a very important milestone in One Health workforce development. 10 years ago, this was probably a distant, distant dream for those ladies and gentlemen who thought of developing a One Idea, a One Idea, One Health Network platform idea for this part of the world. Now, given the role of the universities in the workforce development, and as you realize recently, the increasing nature of pathogens the world over, now even crossing borders from one country to another, crossing continents, a university network like this one, which we are launching today is a very significant pillar in creation of partnerships, in creation of linkages and in synergies. As we have seen and learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, these are key ingredients of successful management of health emergencies, the epidemics that we are witnessing now. Now, if you look at the One Health concept, it recognizes the importance of interconnectedness of disease and health, especially through interaction between humans, animals, and the environment. Here in Uganda, outside the universities, us as ministries and departments and agencies, we have our One Health platform where we discuss and work together to address issues related to zoonotic diseases and, my, and microbial resistance and other such conditions. And it's mainly four ministries, our Ministry of Health, then the Ministry of Animal Industry, Animal Industry and Fisheries. Then we also have Ministry of Water and the Environment. And we have also Ministry of Tourism, mainly represented by uh, Uganda Wildlife Authority. We have our One Health platform where we work very closely and we have our joint national action plan which we implement to address this kind of challenges. So the One Health approach can therefore help us to deliver immense benefits to health promotion and disease prevention and promoting universal health coverage, especially with recognition of other social determinants of health. We therefore must consider exploring its utility in health system and in health service management. Us as government or our ministries, mm -hmm. we appreciate and know that Afrohun is a network of universities in Africa. I do, however, think that your work should not be confined to the walls and gates of the universities. We need to move out and work with other government agencies at all levels, work with the private sector, work with civil society, and any other actors who especially uh, impact on the health status of the people. In this way, we'll be able to build a real, true One Health work culture. As a Minister of Health, and even beyond the Ministry of Health, especially in our partnership on One Health, 
I can also talk on behalf of my colleagues in the Ministry of Water and Environment, in the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries, and also the Uganda Wildlife Authority through our One Health platform, which I have been chairing until last week, actually, when I handed over to our colleague in the Ministry of Water and Environment, who is chairing the platform now for the next one year. We pledge our commitment to work very closely with you, to be available, and we shall share any information you think is appropriate and relevant, especially to promote the World Health Network activities in our Afro Hung. I know universities, you are very much involved in research and publications. For us as government ministries, we are ready to work with you closely as you do your research. We hope we will also benefit from the research you do in order to prepare or to help us develop policies that will address the concerns of our people. So I really want to promise that we are ready to work very closely with you and to be always available to consult each other. I would also like to urge us all to carefully consider what we are learning currently from the COVID-19 pandemic, especially many of us went through issues of preparedness now we entered issues of response. We learned a lot from the partnerships and collaborations. We learned also on issues of system resilience. Actually, when you talk of system resilience, sometimes we keep telling people what has been our success story in Uganda here, especially in addressing the COVID, the COVID challenge, because ideally we have been successful with the around 11,000 cases in the last seven months, six, seven months, and 103 deaths. And we managed to get over 8,000 recoveries. How did we do it? It's because we are able to build resilient systems over time. For us, this pandemic found us, after going through a number of responses to other hemorrhagic fevers and other epidemics, for instance, we had just been battling Ebola in DRC Congo, which was had the potential to come into Uganda through the, our Western border. So we had to go through 18 months of serious res, uh, preparedness and response. We had just been going through the Mabag outbreak, where we also had a few cases which we handled appropriately and responded to. We've also had a few other hemorrhagic fevers of late, we had even yellow fever outbreak, anthrax outbreak in the last 18 months. So we were able to build resilient systems that have helped us to even respond to this uh, COVID pandemic. So this, I'm saying that this kind of lessons learned help us to build the capacities, workforce capacities, competencies and resilience system to address these challenges. And all these have to come out clearly as areas that need urgent attention. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to congratulate Afrohun family, the One Health stakeholder globally, and all of us for working in health-related sectors for attaining this level of growth and determination. Allow me to thank you, Said, and all partners that have provided financial and technical support to the network. And all of you well-wishers who are here, who are with us in this launch, and who are joining in this very important activity. I thank you all for listening to me, for God and my country. Over. Master of Ceremony, I have finished my submission. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Director General Health Services Uganda, Dr. Henry Mwevesa, give him a clap. Uh, when, I, when I spoke here, uh, 
Dr. Dennis Caro, I said about him many things, but the MC has asked me to introduce him to you. I think in this room and uh, maybe in the network, I've known him longest. He met me when I was a young man. Uh, I had hair. I had a, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, vibrant, but of course now not. But I want to say a few words about him and I want to thank him that he has come on to join us despite the fact that he is now retired from USID, but he's still with us. As Deborah said and Jonah, the first person in USID talk about One Health initiative anywhere was Dennis. And many people in USID did not see where he was coming from, but he had a vision. This is a man who had a vision about One Health and what would come and what would happen later on. He's the first man to come and introduce One Health discussions in East Africa and Ziahun. And he has, he would fly to Africa, to Asia, back to Africa, and then Asia, and then back to, to the US. And at times I wondered when he would be at home. He went from university to university, from institution to institution, and some ministries. As he may tell us, it was not easy. There was some resistance. And I said it before, we had problems bringing these ministries. The DG has said they have the Ministry of Health, the, the one for animals, the one for water and tourism. It was not easy to bring them to that platform. But I'm happy to hear the Director General saying the platform works and it has served this country and it still serves many other countries. Of the people that we know in history, the person who championed management of emergencies, pandemics, is Dennis Carroll. He has talked on different fora. He has predicted. He did a lot of work during H1N1. He did a lot of work in Ebola and many other pandemics. And he even, those of you who watch those, is it Netflix or whatever, there is a prediction of what we are seeing here as COVID. Now, there is what they are put on the screen. It was talked about by, by Professor Kawasa. I am one of those people who believe that if something is right, it should be done right. And if you want to do it wrong, I resist even if it means resigning. At that time, that photograph you see is a time which I mentioned earlier that the people we are working with were not from universities. And therefore, they did not know how universities work. And they wanted to manage us as a business. And I said, no. And Dennis said, I will come over next week. He gave me two days. He was here. They were here. We had discussion. That's the day we should have closed the chapter of One Health East, Eastern and Central Africa. But when he came and he explained to them to understand what I was saying, you know, it is very difficult when you are from here, you're explaining to somebody who is holding the money and he thinks that he knows. He explained what one, one health was and what the intention was. And that's why we agreed to sign. And Professor Kabasa was worried that I was going to refuse to sign. But I signed and then we, we moved on. But I want to thank him that he intervened for Africa and for Asia, because that meant that one health in Africa and Asia would have stopped. But there are words that he used to use, and I want to say them. Produce 
graduates with skills that will address pandemics, emergencies, and others of that nature. The last time when we thought about together, because we have had many hours of sitting in his office, he would invite me, I'd go to his office in Washington, only to discuss with him for two, three hours, and we talk and talk, how do we make this work in Africa and Asia? There was a meeting in Malaysia, and we had a long night chat. And this night chat, I am happy, Dennis knows, that has resulted in the expansion of O'Shea to Afrohun, and we agreed after about three hours night discussion that when we include other countries, shall we keep the name? Because he knew my sentiments about O'Shea, and many of the people who work with me know that I still, I call them Afrohun, uh, I say I am O'Shea, but now, from today, I now declare officially I will also be called Afrohun with my colleagues. But we agreed that when we expand, we must cover, try as much as possible, cover the countries that were being affected first and admit them. But also, he convinced me that night that we can actually change the name. And the name will, will look nice, sexy, and the people will like it. So I said, good. So the day we, we were to part, I told him that I have agreed. And he went back to Washington, going to step down from USID, knowing that we'll change the name. So Dennis, as the father of, of O'Shea, as the father, I don't know now whether father of Afrohun or grandfather, you are welcome to speak to us, and I believe you have words of wisdom to give us. Thank you very much. William, first off, uh, can people see and hear me okay? Yes, we see and hear you. Terrific, excellent. Well, first off- We uh, can see and hear you. <laughs> okay, terrific. Look, first off, uh, greetings uh, from Washington, and uh, thank you uh, for the invitation to participate in what is really a very exciting event. Uh, William, thank you for your kind words, and I want to just make a couple of points. First and foremost, the launch of this latest uh, iteration of the University One Health uh, Network. Uh, now quite happily um, known as Afrohun, uh, is a very important day. It underscores what has been a long and uh, really successful evolution in the vision. And, you know, William talked about my vision. It's really not my vision. It's the vision of William and all of the colleagues uh, within Afrohun and Siohun. That is where the leadership has come from. And the evolution in that leadership, your own vision, uh, from the times we began these discussions back in 2009, uh, really represents uh, a, a really powerful example of a the group of people coming together with a shared understanding about the challenges that uh, we collectively face and the need to think differently about how we address those challenges. We, we know that the world we live in today is very different than the world um, our parents lived in and our grandparents lived in. And the world that we're going to be challenged with as we go further into this century really uh, demands that we bring a new vision, a new understanding, a new way of not just thinking, but a new way of acting. And there's no better place to bring that transformation than in the students that will be the leaders of Africa and Asia tomorrow. This is the place where new thinking uh, is takes like um, you know a 
great idea going forward. And we know that if we're going to be successful, the leaders in public health, in veterinary health, in um, wildlife and conservation and ecology in the years to come, they need to bring a different vision and they need to understand the world in a way that really aligns with the reality of the world. And we have to remove the silos that have so for so long trapped us uh, in a narrow understanding of what the world really looks like. And Afrohan is really at the forefront of building that next generation of leaders. I noticed in your website, you talk about 45,000 people trained, extraordinary. And this is really a reflection that the world that um, is coming will be faced with a different quality of leadership um, than the world that has been. And Afrohan is really critical towards that. Uh, in Jana's uh, remarks, she talked about she represented sort of the new blood. Of course, I immediately uh, took that to represent that, or mean that I represent the old blood. Not sure that that's good or bad, um, except to say that having this old blood means that I've had the perspective of seeing the journey um, that you collectively have been on over the course of this very exciting and very important process since the beginning of OSEA. And even before, as William knows, we had a history of working together prior uh, to the beginnings of our One Health Partnership, but really again spoke to how can universities be transformation change agents for making the next generation of leaders even more impactful than today's. So as you begin the next phase of your journey, as we think about the next five years, the opportunities you have and the challenges you have, um, you start from a remarkable place. You have a decade of having built networks, alliances, and have you know, forged your vision on the way forward that really speaks to um, what I think will be the inevitable success of this next five-year venture. And let me say, there's no time when the need for a new vision, a new way of thinking, a new way of acting is needed more than the world we live in today. COVID-19 underscores our vulnerability when we don't get it right, when we don't really address the challenges of emerging diseases based on the, their realities. These are diseases that come from um, multiple sectors involving multiple uh, professional um, skills, require the engagements of communities and require a really dynamically different way of bringing these different communities together. And the opportunity to use Afrohan as the leading wedge for forging new capabilities and alliances between ministries of health, ministries of agriculture, ministries of environment, ministries of forestry, and not just ministries, but also the private sector, and not just the private sector, but also communities. Afrohan is very much the very epicenter of transformation. And I can't tell you how excited and proud I am uh, for the opportunities you have and uh, the way forward that you have arced out for yourself. So uh, William and all of my friends and colleagues within the Afrohan um, universe, uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak to you this morning. But let me just say, I may have retired from USAID, but I have not retired. And I remain engaged, I remain active, and I look forward for opportunities as we go forward uh, where I can be um, engaged and involved with the exciting work that you are and will be doing both in Afrohan and Siohan. So as the saying goes, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. 
Uh, you have 10 years of this journey underway, and the next five years are only going to bring much more uh, exciting development. So um, thank you and congratulations on the new partnerships to UC Davis and all of the new partners within this latest iteration. Um, this is a very exciting time. And again, I'm appreciative of the opportunity to have had a chance just to say a, for, for, say a few words and to express my deepest um, appreciation for the extraordinary work and leadership that Afrohan brings. So thank you very much. Over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dennis Caro, for your leadership always and inspiring us. A new vision. So he's always refreshing us to think differently. We are going to the next segment of this, which is the launch, the afro Hoon launch. In this segment of this, we will have a short video to highlight the genesis of afro Hoon. And we will have thereafter the chief guest, um, the Vice Chancellor of Macron University make the remark and the session of unveiling the Afro Horn um, Consortium. Mr. Vice Chancellor and all the distinguished participants, the network now has hubs in, Afro Horn has hubs in nine countries, creating a strong web that will help to cordon off the germs that threaten the economy of this continent. The countries are carefully selected in consultation, but as partners come in as champions, allow me highlight that we have over 18 universities, the university the montage. The University of Bunia in Cameroon, all these. University, University of Kinshasa, DRC, GMA University, University, Kelly University, those three in Ethiopia, Moy University, Nairobi University in Kenya, Sheikh and Tadiop. Senegal, Muhimbiri, Sokoine in Tanzania, and partners online, University of Rwanda, uh, uh, Kere University and Bara University, and the University of Bogne in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor, those are your high level colleagues <laughs> that you are uh, hosting. You are the host university, and you are championing a major revolution uh, in partnership with the university. I've not read the partners from the US, the first consortium, and now the second consortium uh, who have already been highlighted in the earlier remarks. So we are very grateful. And we thought as we go to this section of the video, to have that background, welcome the team to highlight. One Health, in this case, the One Health initiative that we are launching and addressing now is focusing on the diseases that have been crossing from animals Man. The year 2010 saw the birth of One Health Central and Eastern Africa, or SHARE, 
Embraced by a few institutions in just six countries in East and Central Africa then, this university network progressively expanded to cover West Africa, bringing on board more and diverse institutions. OSHARE, however, has its roots in the Leadership Initiative for Public Health in East Africa, LIPHAIR, which a few years later changed to Health Emergencies Management Program, HEMP. These changes were a natural response to emerging needs in the health management arena. In our first meeting with all these deans, we said, who else impacts public health? We realized veterinary was key, nursing was key, and the, the environment. So we invited, and with, with the support from USID, we brought in schools of veterinary. Each school of public health that was involved, invited one other school of veterinary in their country. So we made schools of public health and schools of veterinary to meet. And when we met, the name had to change. And it changed to One Health. But just before it changed to One Health, as that project was ending of life fair, we realized there were so many epidemics in the region. We formed ourselves into hemp. But then we were schools of public health. Then when brought in the schools of veterinary, we said, we can't be hemp. So we became OSHEA, One Health Central Eastern Africa. The first five years of the network operation from 2010 to 2014 entailed um, development of uh, proof of concept, which basically involved members of the network learning how to work together, how to partner together, and uh, setting up management systems, setting up governance systems, and testing out these systems. So from 2015 to 2019, it was a dynamic phase where the network had learned a lot uh, during the proof of concept phase in the first five years. So at this point, the network was engaging for higher impact. We were engaging partners more. We engaged the government to assess the workforce needs. We also engaged university institutions uh, in the, in the, within the network to standardize uh, most of our programs. And also we started discussions around institutionalization of our programs. But also that time, it entailed uh, growth of the network in terms of geographic expansion. We expanded from uh, Central and Eastern Africa, which was the focus and or share, to West Africa. We went to Cameroon, and now we are also operating in Cote d'Ivoire. That is the recent uh, addition to the network. Personally, I thank the team that I started with. I am a founding member of OSHARE and um, we had a vision about OSHARE. Actually, it started uh, in the year 2005 when we were having a project called LIFEA, a Leadership Initiative for Public Health in East Africa. And at that time, we were dealing with uh, disaster management and uh, response, um, working with the office of the prime minister in Tanzania. And um, we trained a lot of uh, in-service personnel in disaster management. That was life here. We started this network uh, principally because of looking at the future. At the time of uh, initiating this network, we had predicted that the intensification of humans due to increased globalization and increased uh, population explosion and search for needs of humans would result in increased contact, increased numbers of animals, increased numbers of plants, movement, and so on. Along with that intensification of contact is invisible intensification of organisms that are not seen, the microorganisms. So the more animals you have, the more food you have, the more contact you have, 
the bigger also the population of these organisms, and therefore the more contact. Universities by nature are transboundary. That's why we are called university. So as an entry point into building this web of effort across Africa to cordon off uh, the spread of germs, a university is a strong area of entry because universities work together across borders. We are in position to create curricula. We are in position to do research and surveillance and draw an early warning system that can feed into the government efforts. Government efforts tend to be more national in nature than uh, regional. So the universities are bringing that strength and advantage to bring the knowledge to flow quickly from country to country and therefore help the national uh, efforts of Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industries, uh, Food Security and so on to coordinate and do together. And therefore, the Africa-wide network has now become very strong to drive that agenda. To date, the network is working to transform the training environment and approaches in universities in a bid to develop a workforce without disciplinary barriers, enabling students to understand and appreciate the contribution of disciplines outside their own in predicting, detecting, and responding to the kind of complex health challenges we are witnessing today. This is the next generation workforce that we need in the face of increasing outbreaks of epidemics to achieve this transformation, we are reviewing curricula to integrate One Health, designing new and exciting experimental learning multidisciplinary training programs, retooling teachers and trainers, educating communities on existence and transmission of zoonotic and infectious diseases, while engaging national and subnational governments to integrate One Health into national policy and strategic planning. One Health Central and Eastern Africa, or SHARE, has evolved into Africa One Health University Network, AfroHUN, an international network spreading farther and deeper into the continent. Or SHARE, as I said, encompasses One Health for Central, Eastern, and Central Africa. But we've got this urge of people joining Or SHARE, and initially we are resistant, we love the name. Even those who are from West Africa can join. When they join, they will certainly benefit from, from these programs. So we admitted them initially as members. We admitted more universities in the region, more universities in West Africa. And through that, we said, let us now be broad because we are now more relevant to South Africa. We can challenge all the pandemics that come. And we said, let us find a name. Some of the triggers of the new direction is the high demand for the network services. We are at a point where the world needs efficient workforce. A workforce with modern knowledge, but with the ability and the skills to network across sectors. It's fine, they have their technical skills, but they should be able to apply those technical skills, of course, to meet their international health regulations at national level but also they should be able to work across sectors. They should be able to bring together a team, an efficient team that is able to, that has the ability to detect, respond, uh, and also uh, prevent emergencies at the interface of the human animal ecosystem. As Afrohun repositions herself, sustainability and engagement in high impact programming are going to be key features of the network. So we have developed the academy with programs that are going to teach people, but they will not teach for free. They will be online and they will be for different co communities. Students will assess, access these uh, trainings at a different cost. Faculty will do the same. And then the in-service people. Because those who are in service, we need to do refresher courses, but we don't need to bring them to class. We can teach them while online. And now that would be one way of raising resources. But most important, it will make us more re relevant to our ministries, to our communities. Because if you have an outbreak, say in Soro, an outbreak in Addis Ababa, 
we have scattered, trained, well-trained and facilitated uh, personnel to tackle the, the pandemics. The Afrohorn promise, uh, as we look towards the future, is really exciting. So we're at a point where we've learned a lot in the past 11 years. We've also achieved a lot in the past 11 years. So we are consolidating what we've learned and consolidating those achievements into very few but high impact programs. The most exciting bit about uh, the future and what we are promising is that these programs are going to be, they are going to appeal to national interests, but also to international interests, continental. They'll be accessible, uh, Africa-wide, and also globally. to the next phase uh, of handle. Kindly. A scientific, it's called a scientific. You have to speak first. Okay, all right. Um, before we move to the to the other component, would like to receive the vice chancellor, who is the chief guest, but also the chief host, representing all the other consortium members that we represent here right now. I think. Uh, Professor Vaze would like to make a remark before, or oh, that's fine. Thank you. Kindly welcome. the distinguished government officials that are present, the USAID representatives, our development partners, the deputy vice chancellor and members of management present, the chairperson, CEO and the deputy CEO of Afrohun, faculty, students, Afrohun staff, ladies and gentlemen. I warmly welcome you all to this event. Our colleagues attending virtually, welcome to Uganda virtually. This is an auspicious occasion as we celebrate a major milestone in the life of this university network. We are witnessing the evolution of One Health Central and Eastern Africa to Africa One Health University Network, Afrohun. With the projections of the demographic transformations in Africa in the next few decades, there is no other more pressing challenge for universities to tackle than public health. The Africa One Health University Network positions where the role of universities in addressing health challenges through creation of partnerships that facilitate knowledge and skill transfer, workforce development, ensuring that we keep pace with competence needs through regular competence assessments, ensuring that we design and use the right curricula and training approaches, 
engaging in research, innovations, and disseminating these for deployment. I would like to thank the visionaries that are behind the creation of One Health Central and Eastern Africa that has grown into Africa One Health University Network. What started as a small initiative by a few individuals has indeed spread across the continent, creating a formidable network for knowledge and resource sharing. You have set the agenda for One Health on the continent. 10 years of this work positions you well as a leader in One Health workforce development on the continent. This is no mean achievement. I implore you all to meticulously document, package and share your experiences, good practices, successes and challenges widely so as to contribute to improved understanding and effectiveness of similar undertakings. Universities need to learn to go with the flow without compromising quality, of course. Increasingly, we are seeing that the world needs a One Health workforce, and we should position ourselves well to deliver on this by anticipating changing needs. Innovative training approaches, like training in multidisciplinary teams, training at One Health demonstration sites, are providing effective, are approving effective, for instance. We need to institutionalize this for sustainability. Our teachers need retooling. We cannot expect them to deliver a One Health curriculum when their training was totally different. Governments and the employers need to be engaged for us to understand the competences desired in the workspace and design appropriate programs that can deliver the competences. Currently, McKay University is working on a One Health framework that will guide us on how to mainstream One Health in One Teaching, Research, and Service to Community. Once this has gone through the approval process and, impl and the impl implementation begins, we'll have a truly One Health University environment and culture. I call upon all university management representatives attending this event to study the One Health concept critically and to understand the value it adds to our training and the final product. The future workforce is a One Health workforce. I thank the afro Hoon Board, the Leadership Summit, faculty, students, and partners for ensuring that we are in this together. In a special way, allow me to thank USAID for its financial and technical support for the last 10 years of this university network. I request you to applaud the USAID. Our partners along the way, University of Minnesota, Tufts University, the, well, the One Health Workforce Next Generation Consortium led by UC Davis, thank you very much for all the support. You have cont continued to contribute to this growth in a special way. Thank you all for working with us this far. I would like to assure all our partners that Makere University is fully committed to ensuring the success of the afro Horn Initiative and that the university will provide all the necessary assistance to the leadership of the afro Horn Network in order that they may succeed as we all need them to succeed. Now, is it time to unveil? So I will now make this declaration. It is now my singular honor and privilege to declare the Africa One Health University Network, Afrohun officially launched.
Welcome to Afrohun. So, I think you need to show it to the people. Why? <laughs> okay. So, with the pleasure and privilege, we launched the Afrohun. Okay. So may I request the colleagues to come also and endorse. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chancellor and our Chief Guest of Honor. Thank you for launching. Uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor and all the dignitaries, all our partners, wherever you are, we thank you so much for launching the next phase and launching Afro Horn. Uh, young but now mature, uh, we are very grateful. We have the next, which is a toast, I think. So members, uh, can you touch kindly the, the chief toaster? The chief guide on how toast is done. These days toast things are done scientifically. You need to be advised how the toast will be handled kindly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kawata and everybody else. Let's fill up our glasses to toast to Afrohun. And for our, our colleagues online, uh, please pick up any item on your table and we toast to Afrohun. So at a count of three, we will all uh, cheer and toast. And after toasting, please sip your drink in honor of Afrohun. So one, yeah, we have flags on our table. Please make sure you hold it. One person can hold it. Yeah, nice. So one, two, three. Cheers, cheers, cheers in honor of Afrohun. Congratulations. Thanks. Long live Afrohun, long live Makere University, long live Uganda, long live the globe. Congratulations. Thank Cheers you. from distance. And cheers from Tanzania. Cheers from Tanzania. Cheers from DRC. Cheers from Ethiopia. Yes. Cheers from Kenya. Cheers from Africa. Cheers from Cameroon. From Cameroon. From Cameroon. From Senegal. From Rwanda. From Cameroon. From Tanzania. Where are all the doctors in Boca? Rwanda. 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 Rwan
Quebrun, 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 quebrun. Bravo, bravo, félicitations, viva! Félicitations, félicitations! Congratulations! Félicitations, congratulations! Thank you, Professor Kabasa. I have seen that people have forgotten that there's COVID. So kindly give them Félicitations, la République du Congo démocratique. So, Bravo. Professor Tadesse, you are most welcome now to take on the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kabasa. Thank you. All the like partners, partners of the consortium, UC Davis and the Secretariat, all summit, leadership of the summit and the country managers. Thank you so much. We are uh, a little bit behind uh, the schedule. So without, I'm, I'm going to facilitate this presentation with, uh, together with Javer. Javer, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very Javer? much. So, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you, Javer. So we will uh, proceed with the presentation of uh, country showcases, success stories, as with the order or uh, as a set in the schedule in the program. And uh, Javer will uh, take care of the time and maybe he can also summarize at the end of the presentation. Before that, uh, Professor uh, Mauritna Smith will give an overview about the rationale of the country showcases Success stories, uh, brief overview. Professor Martina, please. Thank you so much and congratulations again to everybody for the successful launch of Afrahoon. I think it's a very exciting time and we're very happy to be together. Let me take just a moment to remind us um, of the global nature of this project that you have colleagues around the world, many who are tuned in today. So we are moving into the country showcase section and over today and tomorrow, you will hear some of the celebrations and highlights from the country teams that are part of Afrahoon. We'll have some of them today and some of them tomorrow. So as we think about the many friends and colleagues that we've made around the world over many years, I want to just recognize all the talents and the enthusiasm and the resilience that we've seen as we were in the face of a pandemic this year. This really justifies the need for a global project with the One Health workforce ideas in mind so that we can work across disciplines and across sectors. And many of you participated in some of these events where we brought together real-time updates and discussions about SARS-2 coronavirus and what we were learning and what was happening in different parts of the world. So thank you for all of your efforts and for really working together as a global network of health professionals. As we heard earlier, there are three main global objectives in this USAID One Health Workforce Next Generation project. The bulk of the work in training and empowerment is really what Afrahoon is known for. And we're very happy to be bringing new ideas and innovations to the table. And you'll hear about some of those innovations today and tomorrow. The other two pieces, the objective on workforce assessment and tracking, as well as organizational sustainability 
and also a cross-cutting theme focusing on gender are also very big parts of this project during this <laughs> Uh, window that we find ourselves in. So we will explore these ideas more over the next couple of days and for years beyond. I just wanted to orient everyone to the framework for how we were selected and came to the table to work together as new partners with Afrahoon or as old partners who were coming together in new ways. So let me pass it on to the country showcase teams. These are the countries that we will hear from initially. And uh, we can carry over into tomorrow if we need to for these and for the additional countries that have prepared presentations. Thanks everyone for being here today and congratulations again on the launch of Afrahoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Otina. Uh, now, country manager from uh, Kenya will uh, take the, the stage. Kenya, please. Thank you. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, uh, representing Afrohoon Kenya. Thank I think you, Sam. Secretariat. You can share the slides. We wish to highlight uh, the activities for year one and some successes that we had uh, in the face of COVID-19. So I welcome you to just uh, join us in celebrating what we've been able to accomplish in year one. Um, Secretariat. The slides. Go ahead, Sam. All right, great. Um, so uh, Afro Kenya comprises uh, uh, currently two universities. This is the University of Nairobi, as you can see in the in the cover slide, and the Moi University. And in the University of Nairobi, we're currently at the College of Agriculture and Veterinary Sciences and uh, School of Public Health and more university, we are currently in the School of Public Health. Uh, next slide. So this is the outline of the presentation. Uh, we are looking at the, we look at the background uh, of the year one, uh, the challenges we encountered, some strategies that we engaged in uh, and highlight some four achievements that we, amongst very many things that we did, we'll just highlight some four achievements, running online activities, uh, having uh, partnership engagements, uh, COVID-19 capacity building and the Student One Health uh, Innovation Clubs and then also some year two areas and beyond and what we're looking at, and I'll give you the acknowledgements. So next slide. So our year one began with us outlining various activities. We had 14 activities uh, outlined, like you can see all the way from uh, curricular development to supporting students' uh, innovations. Uh, next slide. As we were working on uh, our year one, next slide. As we were working on our year one activities and uh, uh, planning for the year, commencing October 2019, September 20, 2020, uh, the world uh, COVID-19 was happening in the background, just like you've heard. So work, work planning was happening and uh, the government then had to make some announcements as you can hear from the video there. Play the video, please. Fellow Kenyans, I want to inform you that the Ministry of Health has confirmed the first coronavirus case in Kenya. The government has shut down all schools, both public and private, to avoid the spread of the coronavirus in learning institutions. While universities and tertiary institutions are to close by Friday, 20th March, 2020. So now that announcement brought in a whole new range of challenges that we were not expecting. Despite our work planning that was going on, then new challenges were thrown in. Next slide, please. Next slide. So universities, universities were closed and most of our activities were being planned around student and faculty involvement. And so this would not be held at all. Uh, the universities as well had to rethink how to uh, engage in online teaching. They were also undergoing a new learning curve. Uh, we had restrictions on movement and gatherings, and so that meant we, would, we had to work from home and coordinate a lot of activities from home. And this also interfered with the effective and efficient communication. Uh, getting people virtually was difficult, and uh, you know everybody was dealing with a whole new issue. So it, it was a whole new uh, learning curve and a whole new ball game for us. Next slide. 
So we had to quickly uh, engage in some in some strategies. Uh, people had to undertake uh, personal orientation. Personally, also had to do some personal orientation. We needed to engage uh, routinely and more frequently with the deans. So we decided to be holding monthly deans meetings uh, to just uh, get the direction right. We needed we got and sought support from the secretariat, which was given. We used a lot of advice that was given from the secretariat and the global consortium. We needed to get the teams inspired to adopt a new way of doing things online. And we also engaged highly in the 80-20 Pareto principle of management, where we needed to look at areas that, you know, the 20% areas that we can that can actually give us 80% results. So that those are some of the strategies that we engaged in. And so moving on to, yes, just next slide, moving on to the achievements that we have. Um, I had indicated that we'll highlight some four key achievements. So one of them was running activities online. And this, you can see the logo, the, the Zoom there, Zoom became the new buzzword and the new norm. Of course, uh, next to some cliches and phrase words, uh, including, can you hear me? Um, you know, that became the new uh, catchphrase. Can you hear me? Uh, you are muted, uh, unmute yourself. So we got to quickly learn these new catchphrases and get to acquaint ourselves with uh, the online collaborative platforms, including Zoom, uh, Google Meet, amongst others. And these were some of the, the areas that we ran our activities. And so we held, we were able to hold uh, a, a development challenge for students that ran for six weeks with students being distributed all over the country. So we had an activity running for six weeks with eight teams that ran to the finalists, comprising 62 students, representing seven universities and one middle-level college, 17 disciplines, and eventually we had uh, three up that uh, were selected by the judges. We also ran an antimicrobial resistance curriculum customization workshop that had at least 19 uh, subject matter experts coordinating online virtually from wherever they are to customize an AMR curriculum. We held a global case competition for students where we had six teams of students with 35 students and five universities representing 12 disciplines working online virtually from wherever they are. We also engaged a lot with uh, very many partners uh, to run these activities. We had Makerspace uh, Science and Technology Park from the University of Nairobi uh, that offered their innovative space for the students to work in. And that is going to run on uh, from the time the activity was done. We had uh, we engaged with the Child Development Foundation from the UK who also gave mentorship to the students, a 12-week mentorship program uh, for the students uh, to engage in. And that is being, the, the planning for that is currently ongoing. We engaged with the government's um, public health officers and technicians council to run a, a, a COVID-19 capacity building for non-clinical frontline workers, specifically public health officers. We also had synergy enhancement. We really engaged with the Ministry of Health, Environment Institute of Kenya, the M USAID, MTAP, uh, USAID, IDDS, uh, core group, IFRC and FAO amongst others to actually engage with some of the activities that we had, we had as Afrohun uh, Kenya. And all these were being held online. Um, we did capacity building for COVID-19. Before the COVID uh, declaration in Kenya, we did sensitization for students where we had 71 uh, students participating in, in the COVID-19 sensitization. We also held capacity building, like I indicated, for non-clinical frontline, worker uh, frontline workers. And the image you can see there, on the right was for an activity that the students did for a digital challenge. We also had our students engaging, and these were uh, uh, student-led and student-initiated activities by our st student One Health Innovation Clubs, where they held a lot of webinars uh, throughout this entire period online. And that was an example of a certificate that was issued to uh, students global students participating in the multidisciplinary One Health student uh, small working group activity where they discussed zoonotic diseases amongst other infectious diseases and all these being coordinated online. Uh, next slide. So these are some of the voices from the activities that uh, we held. Uh, play, that, play the video. Play the video, please. We just want to hear voices. We've, 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 we've organized for a program that takes around six weeks. So we formed teams from um, different backgrounds and even different universities. Hello everyone, I'm the team leader change makers. So uh, my team is composed of Nelly, Stacy, Lewis, Sam, Hel Helen, Debbie, and me. So uh, we identified that uh, basically, our idea was to make healthcare accessible through 
um, the last mile healthcare worker. So uh, we created a tool that will be used by the community health volunteers to make healthcare accessible. And the wonderful Dr. Sam Ruhio, Derek Mugasia Ernest and Co. decided to change things. We came in and we were told there's something called you know, human-centered design. We were taken through classes. Some of them were so long, this thing was new. And through the process, they are like, yes, we know you came in with proposals. Yeah, you guys did your best. But you know, um, yeah, you need to start again. And some of us were pretty discouraged, but we are happy now because uh, what came out of the process was awesome. It was awesome, and we were so happy. And I was like, in my mind, how is this going to be possible? The first, the winning team is actually change makers. <laughs> Here we go! Yeah! <laughs> hey, wow. hey, hey, hey! Woo! <laughs> oh my I'm God, this is that, so unexpected. <laughs> you're honored, you're so happy. This has been eye-opening to see the, the talent that right. Kenya has. We can move on to the next slide. Um, the, the journey and process and um you know i've even i've even, I've even instructed my team to start maybe looking for office space in kenya i want to sincerely appreciate afro for Excellent. the collaboration that we've had um with them uh, so that we make this possible continuing professional development is a process that will um, um, richly benefit public health officers and technicians across the country good uh, afternoon to all of us we can move as, to the next uh, slide. Some have used me already. Uh, my name is Amadiva Kibiso. Uh, currently at the Emergency Operations Center, Nairobi. Next slide, please. Thank you. So moving on to year two, we want to build on the successes of year one, uh, leverage on innovation and technology and partnerships, and institutionalize activities into programs as we've indicated in those samples. Next slide. And I wish to give acknowledgments to all the people indicated uh, in that slide. Thank you. Over to you, uh, moderator. Thank you very Thank much. You, Sam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, now, I think, uh, I hope you keep noting your question is uh, uh, clarification is at the end. Uh, I'll so, be taking notes of questions, uh, Professor, and then uh, if there are any, uh, I'll bring them to your attention. Yes. So you shall continue the next presentation, right? Yes, please. So Cameroon. Cameroon, are you there? Hello. Hello, yes. Denis. Yes. Bonjour ou bonsoir to Cameroon. Bonjour, bonjour, bonsoir. Okay, please, can you see my screen? Sorry. Yes, Denis, we can see it if you can uh, put it uh, in uh, presenter mode. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I wish to appreciate this opportunity uh, you are giving for us to share uh, our experience uh, from Cameroon. Uh, this is wonderful day. And I'm sure uh, some years back, nobody could believe uh, this uh, number of people uh, meeting just through computers. And this is part of our story. So I uh, wish to to share with you the genesis of uh, one of our uh, major sub-projects, which is uh, COVID-19 related on strengthening capacities of the university in COVID, with communication and community engagement, training and training using e-learning systems. Uh, this is a picture uh, recorded some years ago, last year, 
2019. So we'll present the outcome, how the needs arise, and the impact. I need to emphasize on the fact that the project is still going on, uh, but already we thought it was important for us to share with you our lesson learned in selective agency. So some years back in Cameroon, like in some other African countries, the government has invested a lot in promoting e-learning uh, through the Ministry of Higher Education. The e-learning was prescribed as a major priority to improve the academic offerings in the country. And recently, an e-national higher education network program was set with the major targets to strengthen capacities of the universities in terms of IT in order to promote distance education. So you have some pictures here on the top uh, right. You have the IT center of uh, one of our university universities. And each state university has been uh, provided a similar facility. And then we have the coordination center at central level. So and one of uh, the striking uh, achievements by the government in promoting the e in Cameroon was the free donation of the laptops to all students, be for private or state-owned institutions. And the process started uh, two years ago, and it's still going on. We have some pictures here of the our Minister of State in charge of higher education, uh, presenting laptops to students. Then uh, came uh, the COVID-19 problem. And the government, like in many other countries, uh, started addressing the challenge with a battery of measures. Uh, one of the key ones being closure of campuses, that is stopping face-to-face -face training activities. A multi-sectoral task force was set, led by the Ministry of Public Health. And the major challenge was to make sure we have proper communication around the disease. So as uh, Sam just presented the case in, in, in Kenya, we have our work plan with all the activities with most of them, plans to be conducted face to face. So we had challenge, double challenge. First of all, at the level of the room, and then the general challenge as faculty at the level of the universities. So some questions came up, how to enable continuity of higher education in university business, how to make available accurate information and avoid misinformation. How could university be supported and, so, and better support the government's action? And since it was not going to last forever, how could we better prepare for the activation of face-to-face -face activity on campuses? So at the level of the universities, there were some specific challenges. The e-learning systems were set, but most institution, in most institutions, these uh, systems were not fully functional. And the shift to, uh, the team is shift to face-to-face -to -face training, which started in June, June 2020, rather, uh, rather, it was observed that from the e-learning, total e-learning phase, teaching activities were rather conducted using open, standard open systems, like uh, WhatsApp, Classroom, and this platform might present some challenges in terms of monitoring and even security. And faculty, as well as students, had only limited IT and e learning skills. So this was the battery of challenges we were facing. But we look at it critically, and finally, we can say today that the COVID-19 outbreak is part of the unique strategies to address. So we thought of using e-learning system to foster the COVID-19 Communication. 
And we had two strategies. One, to strengthen the e-learning systems of various institutions in order to foster compliance to the restriction measure prescribed by the government. And secondly, using these platforms to accelerate the process and the implementation of its communication strategies in various universities. Denis, you are at six minutes. Okay. So the general objective of the project is to strengthen capacities for university in risk communication and community engagement and training using e-learning systems and with targets essentially improve university capability for distance learning and strengthen capacity of teaching staff in e-learning, enhance university preparedness to minimize the risk of COVID-19 threats on campuses. So these are some uh, impacts of uh, this project, which is still going on, but which can only be felt at, at the level of Afroon and in Cameroon in general. So this is the, the Cameroon map. And uh, before the emergence of uh, COVID outbreak, Afroon was mostly active in two institutions, University of Montana, which is the pioneer member, and the University of Boya. But this project now came to expand the scope, moving to e-learning, so supporting strengthening of teaching skills, but more importantly, engaging beyond our member institutions. And the project today is impacting 17 universities, including all the eight state universities and nine private, eight private and one inter-state university. So the major target is to have universities community with improved awareness. And at the end, by the end of this project, we have 17 trainers, 3,000 students with improved skills in e-learning, 60 trainers in risk communication, and at least 5,000 students with improved skills in risk communication. In addition, we have two teleconference centers equipped at the University of Boya and UDM. You have two so minutes. It's uh, quite innovative, and we adopted the four-step strategy. First, for, to identify the gaps, addressing the identified gaps. Then, have our e-learning champions trained for each institution. And then at the end, these e-learning champions, we train the e-learning focal points in each establishment. For risk communication strategy on campus, we use both passive, but it is essentially built on existing structures and promotion of virtual community of practice. You are at one minute, Denis. Huh? Okay. So our approach we think is replicable as we adopted the DOT approach. And we, we emphasize on using existing uh, structures. So this is the picture of the launching ceremony of the project. I'm very grateful to all the partners, US8, and all the one half of our next generation consortium. I'm very sorry, I took longer than what I was supposed to do. But yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Denis. Thank you, Afrohun Cameroon. Thank you, Afrohun Cameroon. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to remind all participants to take notes whenever necessary for clarification and uh, questions at the end of the session. Now we'll continue with. Team Ethiopia, please. Are you ready? If, if you have any questions, please put them on the chat. I will take note and then try to summarize at the end. Yes, yes, very good. OK. OK, Team Ethiopia, the floor is yours. Hello? Hello? 
Team Ethiopia. Uh, wait, I think he's talking, but. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please, you are Hello? waiting, go ahead. Yeah, thank go you ahead. very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Beringu Gabrakidan from Afron, Ethiopia. As you can see from, uh, from the slide, uh, the amazing uh, colorful landscape Ethiopia, the place where the scientists found the three million old woman called Lucy, uh, we can say the mother of all of us. Allow me to present the Ethiopia showcase uh, topics. Um, at, yeah, as you can see, the member of Afron Ethiopia are Matala University, uh, Juma University, and Addis Ababa University, whereby five institutions are member. So from uh, the last one year, we performed and conducted many activities, but uh, for now, we, we selected two showcase topics for you. One is student engagement in One Health and uh, COVID-19 activities. And just the second is the role of Afron Ethiopia on prevention of COVID-19. When, when we can see the student engagement in One Health and COVID-19, uh, as you can see from the slide, the students One Health Innovation Club in Juma and Macaulay University have been very active for the last five years in their respective institution. But following the outbreak of COVID-19, the National Student One Health Innovation Club was established in February 22, 2020. Now they have their own leadership, like president, vice president, and secretary, and there are also some university uh, regional representatives. So you can see the student's leadership here. You can see out of uh, 12 uh, leaders, uh, eight are female and from different disciplines throughout the country. So they have their own object, uh, objectives, like um, bringing different university students from different disciplines in collaboration to collaborate each other, and also to engage in one health concept, not in Ethiopia, and to create a well-informed younger generation from, the from different disciplines and from different Ethiopian universities so that we have a next generation one health workforce in Hansen. So far, the, the impact what we have seen from the National Student Club is like they, they got mentorship, training, and, and so on, but also they shared, and they shared videos and articles. You can see more than 4,000 articles are shared, and also 1,000 news and updates, 400 trainings, like also 77 uh, related, one has related videos shared through mass medias. And as you can see again, 9,000 9, students have participated, have participated in activities as participants and followers of these activities they had. And they all, the, 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 the communication and express sharing strategies they have is through social media. They opened many pages like Facebook, uh, Telegram, and other blogs, and they shared the information and they learn each other and teach each other. So they also produced short videos and, uh, and distributed to the community and to the, to, the member, to the members of the students. Similarly, they prepared and distributed flyers, posters, and banners to the students in the community. And also, they, they all, they, not only they learned a lot, but also they helped a lot for the community, like the mobilization and awareness creation in different activities that we had through Afrohood. So this was, this was all about the students' in engagement. And the second was the role of Afro in Ethiopia in prevention of COVID-19. Uh, um, as you can see, Ethiopia, Afro in Ethiopia initially prepared uh, year one activity, in fact, which was not uh, related to COVID-19, but due to the COVID uh, pandemic happened worldwide and official requests came from the government, um, our office, already planned and shifted in fact, to focus 19 prevention. And we developed a concept notes approved in different levels like the secretariat and consortium. So we implemented the activities in many ways, in many ways like um, public education through trainings, like I can, you can see from the numbers, 98 health professionals and 120 security personnel, like 160 uh, persons working in quarantine centers and 14 lab technician working in diagnostic laboratory on the COVID. 
uh, have, have taken the training, like you, you can see in Juma, Makala, and Addis Ababa. The second issue was on, on public education and sensitization through mainstream medias. We have conducted um, six, six television pro, uh, TV program and 11 times in, in radio program in advocating One Health and also COVID prevention ways. So the other was public education and sensitization through social medias. We had we have already social medias like uh, in the in the Facebook and uh, Twitter. So we usually post all the things that we met and educate the people. And the other way was public education through uh, printed materials, like nearly 100 banners, very big banners posted on the main streets of Makala, Juma, and Addis Ababa have been okay settled then. And uh, more than 7,000 leaflet stickers were prepared and distributed in, in different parts of the city. The other amazing was, was the communist sensitization through loudspeaker in public gatherings, like, and also social occasions like the markets, the churches, and the mosques. So we, we did this in, in different, uh, like in different uh, cities, like Addis Ababa, Juma, and Makala, the same thing, to sensitize the people on prevention and control of the COVID 19. And the same way to reach many students, as many as possible students, we again uh, use as there many web sites the, through the social medias. You can see if we act, if we did, if you conduct some activity, you can see they, it will be posted in many pages. Like the awareness question in safety measure for election facilitated the same thing. In fact, this was demand driven after, after performing well in awareness questions through the loudspeaker and the printing materials, we were asked to, to participate in this uh, polling centers as well. Yeah, the, output of, uh, the output of this activity was, as you can see, many people protected from the COVID-19 we, we are living. And the mindset of the community towards one is improved. This indicate this can be indicated by demand is coming from all sides, and also as you can see from the slide, more than two point something million people uh, have got uh, the information benefited, and also those that are there were and are now many challenges here and there. Um, we try to make the Afro home flag in the highest mountain, and they can see, and we'll try to make it in the highest mountain to be visible to many and to benefit to many. So this was what we were doing there. And um, as you can see from partner organizations, the universities like Mekala, Juma, and Addis Ababa University have participated and also Ministry of Health, in fact, represented by Bureau of Health in Romia, in Addis Ababa and in Tigray were part of it, the media, the local administration, and also the NGOs, especially the USAID mission, were part of this thing. So you can see, you can appreciate Ethiopia by the ancient Ethiopian um, construction. You can see 100 years before uh, Christ. Uh, so this was all about what we, what we did. What we did the out of the many what we did, the two best experience that we want to share to you. Thank you. Over. Thank you, Team Ethiopia, for the presentation. Javier, are you there? I am, I am. Are you there? Yeah, I'm in okay. <laughs> okay, let's, let's go over to Team Rwanda. Team Rwanda, please. I would like to remind uh, all uh, uh, participants to put your questions and comments on the chat box, please. Uh, hello. Yes, Team Rwanda. Hello. Good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Timothy, can you can you share our 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 presentation? I have a question while they're loading the presentation to the secretariat team on if you are wanting to end on time, should we save Rwanda and DRC for tomorrow or shall we continue today and run long? Hello, we are there. Uh, this is Rwanda. Hi, Ren. 
Yeah, yes. let's let's save it for tomorrow. Okay, okay. We can, so the RT will be tomorrow. Yeah. It's a very special presentation, and I would hate for people to drop because they have other engagements. So perhaps we can adjust our timing tomorrow to accommodate it. I think we have a plan for that. Um, so we would love to hear from Rwanda and DRC tomorrow and be able to really enjoy the presentations together. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll be there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Rwanda and the RC will be moved to for tomorrow. Thank That's you. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. You all, thank you, thank you. Stay safe. So, okay, thank uh, you. Stay safe. So thank you, uh, Javier, can is there any question? I didn't see any question, but I would like to thank uh, everybody that uh, presented today. And I just wanted to highlight that uh, we can see countries uh, separately in the presentations, but um, I can witness that all the country managers have been working together closely and uh, you know, benefiting each other. We've done a fantastic job. I'm looking forward to uh, more activities in the future. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. I want to thank the team. Day. And we want to say happy birthday to I will wish you many, many years of uh, good work. So uh, for our colleagues who are online, we have a cake. We will send you pieces. <laughs> so, uh, don't call upon uh, the Vice Chancellor of Makere University and the team at the high table and one student uh, to come and uh, support this ceremony of cake cutting. It looks really, really oh, yummy. Yeah. So, yeah. Please ensure there is social distancing in the cake cutting. A hundred fifty eighty thirty twenty five. Five, one, zero. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, team. Nice Kenya. cake. Congrats, congrats from Tanzania. Come for DRC one Show part. Show them. Please keep for us one part for DRC, please. Show them the cake. Oh no, it's good. I like it. That's good. I can test it. Please, uh, Tima Frohun, come and help, please. It is, it is too beautiful to eat. I can yes, I think so. <laughs> we can keep it in a museum someplace. <laughs> Uh, I can see. Baron is so so nice. We have Tracy who was uh, doing the uh, illustrations. And uh, Tracy, if you're still online, you can please display your work, how far you've been able to go today. People are eagerly waiting to view that piece of art. Nina, is Tracy still online? Okay. Uh -oh. 
we can see it. Thank you for sharing it. So Trace has been capturing the story as we had the discussions and the presentations, and this is what she's presenting now. Uh, as we are viewing Tracy's work, Professor Philemon Wambra, please give us some closing remarks. Professor Wambra is the chair board, uh, Afrohun board of directors. Professor Wambura. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, fellow participants that have been online, in the interest of time, we know that he, in Tanzania we are going through elections today. Maybe he has gone to cast his vote. Uh, we will now I will now give a few remarks and we close. I'd like in a special way, want to thank our Vice Chancellor from Makere University, oh, my who has stayed with us from the beginning up to the end, give him a clap. And he's a deputy in charge of academic affairs, Professor Umar Kakumba, who has been with us throughout. I want to thank our our partners who have been online throughout for three hours, give them a clap. I want to thank our service providers, including those who have been doing interpretation, give them a clap. I want to thank those in the IT section who have been connecting us so that we hear each other, give them a clap. In a special way, I want to thank the Secretariat team that has put this launch together over time, with sleepless nights, it has come to pass. Thank you very much, and congratulations. At the end of it all, I want to thank our MC who has led us up to this, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow again on the same chat to listen to our countries, to our students, and the other activities for the launch. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Session closed. Uh, yes.